All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. My name is Larry Donovan. I am the CEO of Namely. I'd like to welcome you to our event today, uh, where we're joined uh, with Adam by Adam Grant. Uh, Adam is going to help us kind of wade through the crazy of 2020 uh, and, and talk a bit about uh, some things you can think about as we head into 2021. I don't think there's anybody that uh, isn't enthusiastic about this year kind of turning into the next one. And in particular today, I'm in New York City where I'm watch, waiting for it to snow like mad. We're supposed to get 16 inches of wet, nasty snow, which frankly, the city doesn't need at the moment, but it's just one more obstacle for us to, to, to deal with today. Let me begin uh, by introducing Adam. Adam Grant is an advisor to Namely, has been for the last couple of years. Uh, he's also Wharton's top rated professor for seven straight years. Uh, Adam's a leading expert on finding motivation and meaning, uh, living more generous and creative lives, uh, and has been recognized as one of the top uh, management thinkers uh, in the United States. He's an author of three best-selling books, uh, speaking of overachievement, over, sold over a million copies in 35 languages. Uh, he also has a, 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 a TED original podcast, a TED Talk original podcast uh, called Work Life. Uh, that has been very well received that some of you may have heard about. Uh, we're delighted to have Adam with us today. Adam, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Larry. Glad to be here. I'm in Philly and the snow just started about two minutes ago it? and it already yeah. has blanketed everything. So something for you to yeah. look forward to. <laughs> I, I'm kind of excited about it in a sick sort of way because I rarely leave the apartment much these days anyway, so I might as well watch it snow. Although I must say that uh, I don't know, you know, we went to no indoor dining earlier this week and we have all of these outdoor dining uh, uh, kiosks that are in the parking spaces uh, on the streets and I'm worried about what's gonna happen when the plows start coming. It's gonna be yet one more challenge for restaurateurs during the pandemic. Um, so uh, we, uh, a couple of other uh, housekeeping notes, by the way, um, we are recording the event. We will send everyone who's participating a link to the recording. Also, uh, we are giving away some copies of Adam's book. Uh, we did that with a drawing. And for those of you that are receiving the book, uh, you'll get an email uh, in the next week or two as follow up so we can send it off to you. Um, the Q&A is open. I will be monitoring it during the 45 minute session today. So if you have a question you'd like to ask, I'll watch for those and, and we'll, do, uh, we'll do a good job of, of grabbing some of that uh, interest in real time as well. So with that said, let's get, let's get started. We've got a, we've got a, a handful of, of interesting topics that we're gonna, we're gonna talk to Adam about and get his perspective on. Let's start with this. Um, you know, you've, you've talked a lot about work-life balance uh, in, in, the, in your writing and, and, and your uh, speaking, uh, both before and since the pandemic. Adam, tell us about some of the most impactful ways you think leaders can help their, especially mid-sized companies who we target very specifically, um, you know, guide their employees during such a difficult time? Well, it's interesting, Larry, because I, I become increasingly dissatisfied with the idea of work-life balance. Um, you know, to me, it creates this, this mythical expectation that you can have every single part of your life in perfect equilibrium. And I haven't lived a day yet where I felt that was true, right? Now, maybe over the course of a month or a year, I feel like I'm in balance. But what I'm looking for much more is a sense of work-life rhythm where you know, if, you, if you think about your week as, you know, as a song, right? You, you might have a chorus that plays repeatedly, but then you also might have some different lyrics and melodies that, that carry throughout the week. And so the way that I've wanted my work life to work is to say, okay, I might have a couple days each week where I feel like I'm heavily focused on work and I don't have time for a lot else. But then I also have a couple days that are completely family oriented and I don't do much work there. And I think all of us have been struggling with this during the pandemic, right? A lot of people have said, well, I'm, I'm not really sure if I'm sleeping at home or, uh, or at work, or you know, have, I, have I actually ended up in a situation where I'm living at work, uh, or I'm not, I'm not sure. And the blurring of boundaries, I think, is a huge challenge for a lot of people. Um, my colleague, Nancy Rothbard, has studied the differences between integrators and segmenters for a long time. So integrators are people who are very comfortable bringing their work home. Uh, they're excited to show pictures of their kids at work um, and they just love to blur the boundaries. Segmenters are the opposite. They want a strict border between work and the rest of life. And the data that have come out just over the past couple of months show that during the pandemic, segmenters are struggling more than integrators um, because of this, you know, this, this inability to separate. So I think there's a lot employers can do to help with that. 
First thing I would say is we need permission to not work. Um, we know empirically that the average person is maybe online two to three hours more per day than they were pre-pandemic. Uh, we need to set some boundaries around that. I love as an example, um, Dynamic, which has a, a Zmail policy that says no emails on nights or weekends and everybody in the company agrees to it. Uh, you can still send, I guess, but nobody's expected to check. And yeah, so right, 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 right. it's not gonna ruin anyone's day. But they say, look, if anything's really important, pick up the phone and call uh, if there's an emergency. But otherwise we wanna protect people's time. Um, and I think that's a huge step in the right direction. I think we're also starting to see more companies move towards saying, you know what, let's protect some no meeting zones. So we have, uh, we have organizations like uh, Rackspace saying, we don't do internal meetings on Wednesdays. Uh, we've seen Levi Strauss say, all right, no meetings on Fridays, period. And I think we have good reason to believe that this is actually a step in the right direction. There's a great experiment that Leslie Perlow at HBS did a few years back, where at a Fortune 500 software company in India, she set a quiet time policy where there were no meetings or interruptions allowed before noon on Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Mm. And if people manage that themselves, you get 47% above average productivity. If the organization actually makes this a norm and says, hey, we're enforcing this, 65% above average productivity. And I think part of it is that people are able to concentrate on deep work and find flow and really get absorbed in their tasks. And they know they have at least three mornings a week to do that. But part of it is also the efficiency gain of I opened my inbox after lunch. I see that Larry, you and eight other people have sent me basically the same question and I bring you all together and I can mm -hmm. field it once as opposed to nine times. And I'm also then helping you build a network of people that you can share ideas with and compare notes with who may have common challenges, but don't know each other that well. And I don't think there's anything magical about Tuesday, Thursday, Friday before noon, but I think the idea of creating an organizational boundary that says here are times when you're free to, to do your own work. And also here are times when we don't expect you to work that is sorely needed during this pandemic. What do you make of all that? Yeah, you know, it's actually several aspects of it resonate very strongly with me. Um, when we got early into the pandemic, you know, we talked about giving some folks some extra time and we have an unlimited PTO policy at Namely. So like take the time off, you know, as a CEO, I was a bit perplexed by it. But what I discovered it is exactly where you're at in, in terms of thinking is we had to make it okay. We had to take everyone out so that there wouldn't be this for sense of responsibility when others were trying to move things forward. Everyone stopped briefly and uh, the, the impact shocked me by how enthusiastically people received it. And we've experimented with the no meeting day stuff where we, in fact, for over the Christmas holiday, we declared the Christmas Eve day and the day after Christmas as no meet internal meeting days. Uh, and then encouraged everyone to take a day off because our customers are at their busiest right now. So closing, closing the support center wasn't an option. Um, but this felt like a good compromise that kind of made it okay uh, and encouraged people to do it. I have to ask you something though, because you, you, you commented a little bit on it briefly. I noticed a, a post in LinkedIn a, a couple of weeks ago where you talked to, you challenged this notion about calling, uh, uh, this notion of a work family. Um, and I commented about it because it resonated very strongly with me as well, because I have my family, I have my chosen family, and I have people that I have worked with that have become my chosen family. Um, but I've, as much as I'm very, very focused on, on creating culture and care deeply about the people I work with, uh, that was a boundary for me. So I was curious, what was the genesis for that post? Uh, well, it was, I think, just one too many companies saying, you know, we, we really are family here. And then laying off a bunch of people in March with no warning, with no attempt to say, could yeah. we do executive pay cuts? True. Or could we try a furlough? Or could we even bring the, you know, the company together and say, look, we're, we're really suffering financially right now. What could we do to save everyone's jobs? We don't want to cut anyone. And you know, the, the fact that a lot of companies that claim to be a family did that so quickly and frankly, so ruthlessly, um, you know, just, just drove home for me that it's not realistic to expect a workplace to be a family. Right. I mean, I guess there are some families where, you know, where parents fire their children. <laughs> but but yeah. I think, you know, when, when you say you're a family, you expect unconditional love. Right. You don't expect that you're going to be disowned from the family if you yeah. don't perform uh, or, you know, if, if you have a hard week or for, for that matter, if the family ends up facing difficulties financially or emotionally. And so I just, I think it's one of those metaphors that doesn't translate well, especially to a world of, of at-will employment that we have in the US, 
And I think what, what leaders are trying to say when they say, look, you know, this company is a family is we create a sense of belonging and inclusion here. We care about each other. We want people to be givers rather than takers. And this is gonna be a community. And guess what? I think that makes a lot more sense because if you think about what it means to be a member of a community, you can be removed from the community if you're not contributing, if you're not living up to the values and norms. And so I think I would just love to see more companies calibrate expectations there and say, look, you know, maybe we wanna create a family feeling, but make no mistake, this is a company. Right? We have goals, we have stakeholders, uh, we care about performance as well as well-being, and so you're, we're not going to treat you just like you're a member of a family. Yeah, and I think those like those miniature family relationships develop. You know, I have people that are part of my chosen family now that I worked with 20 years ago, and even one or two that actually work at Namely today. You know, and, and it's when it, when you make that transition to it's almost hard because you kind of for me anyway. You know, the relationship you know is endearing and it's more important um and so yeah but you also have to recognize there's a certain amount of separation in that so i, lo I love that you said that because it also it also felt like at times it lacked authenticity for me when people just threw the word out there kind of you know willy-nilly uh it, you know family's too important a word at least in my view as a as a leader to even suggest that you'd make you know make that close a connection i i think so too and i would also say larry i mean every everyone who's ever been a member of a family knows how dysfunctional they can become Right. So <laughs> there's also the layer of saying, OK, you know, we're, we're not going to get to the love, but we also want to transcend the dysfunction that we yeah. see in too many families. Yeah. And we want to build a healthier, you know, more productive organization. So let's let's think about what a thriving community looks like. Yeah. Well, and the fact that <clears throat> when families have that kind of dysfunction, it can it can get mirrored in the organization. Sometimes the way you deal with your dysfunctional family actually can be very effective as a leader, I've found over the years as well. So it's humorous in that regard. That's great. Thanks, Adam. Let, let's talk a little bit about remote work because obviously it's, it, it, you talked about how it's affecting people in terms of the way they operate and how their personalities kind of evolve uh, as a result of that. Um, but, but I think that you know, the, the, the world of work and, and, and working in an office has changed forever. Um, you know, people are likely to not ever be willing to commute to an office every day. Um, now that we've proven how so easily it is, um, you know, I know it means that this giant amount of office space I have in the financial district in New York is going to be sitting here for a while empty. Um, but that's okay, because I've always been a personal advocate for remote work. But do you think those changes are, are, are for good? And if so, you know, how do we rethink the way we approach work in a world where, where all the time somebody's going to be remote? I think they're mostly for the good. I think they're, they're obviously going to create some unintended consequences too. But I think... You know, it's, it's surprising to me to, to rewind the clock a couple of years. Uh, almost three years ago, beginning of 2018, I went to some of the most influential CEOs in Silicon Valley. And I said, look, I want to do a remote Friday experiment where you just give your employees one day a week to work from anywhere. And I want to test the effects on productivity, creativity, collaboration. Mm -hmm. None of them were willing to try the experiment. Really? They said, look, we can't, we can't open Pandora's box. Uh, if we let people leave, they might never come back. And we know everyone's gonna be a bunch of lazy procrastinators because they'll lack the structure. Uh, we think collaboration's gonna you know, really suffer and especially um, creativity and culture are, you know, are really going to just fall by the wayside if people are not in the same place every day. And hilariously, several of those CEOs have now announced that they might never go back to an office. Uh, right, 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 we're, we're among the first, first companies in America to say when the pandemic first hit, you know what, we're, we're remote for at least a year. And I think what I worry about now is that we're, we're starting to overcorrect a little bit. So what I love about remote work is obviously the flexibility. We know that people will work harder and smarter when, when they get some choice and autonomy to decide when they work and how they get things done and they can find routines that work for them. Um, I think another, another real benefit, of course, is to be able to, to bring in talent from anywhere right? and not be limited to the people who happen to live in, you know, in, in your, your headquarter city or in a place where you have an office. And also then giving people the flexibility to, instead of doing a sabbatical and going somewhere else, right, to, to let people go and, you know, work for a couple of months in the place they've always wanted to live and visit. So I think there's a, there's a lot of upside from a talent standpoint. I do think, though, it's very difficult to build a strong culture, remote only. And the data that I'm seeing from most companies that are starting to survey their employees across industries is people want to be in the office about three days a week on average, and they want two days to be flexible. I think that also tracks with this Nick Bloom experiment at C-Trip, 
Uh, so call center employees, this is pre-pandemic, were randomly assigned to work from home. And over the next six to nine months, they were 13 and a half percent more productive and they were half as likely to quit. And if you stop there, you say, this is great news, but there are a couple of wrinkles. One is that after the study is over, half of those people want to come back to work. They miss, they miss the structure, they miss the community. And then also, even though those people are more productive, they're less likely to get promoted because they lack face time with, with their bosses right. or with senior leaders. And so I think one of the, the real problems we're gonna run into is there are gonna be some people in a lot of organizations who will be on site more than others. And that's gonna give them an unfair advantage. They're not necessarily contributing more or working harder, right? But they are more visible. And so I think we're gonna to have to figure out how to manage those status disparities. And we know we're not good at that, right? Look at what a disaster we've been in terms of running companies that really welcome women and minorities into positions of influence and leadership. Right? Look at how horrible we've been at inclusion of people who lack status because they might be the only salesperson in a team of engineers. And so I think we have a new layer of status disparities that we're going to have to figure out how to navigate. Yeah, I worked remote from 1989 to 1993, you know, clearly when it wasn't. You know, wow, pleasure. early adopter. And yeah, and I, I, honestly, I haven't done it since. Uh, and uh, while I don't think it hurt my well, I don't think it hurt my career progression because I was able to travel there on a regular basis. Uh, it absolutely, you know, came back to bite me in terms of personal interaction. And when we, we, we took our call center in Atlanta remote. And as you probably aware, you know, the, the number one issue in, Atlanta, in the Atlanta area is traffic. And, um, you know, the folks in our call center have, have made it very clear to us, they never want to come back. But I think you're right. I think that as people kind of reconnect with that sense of community, they're going to want it again. And what we're looking at doing there is we operate in support pods. So groups of people that support groups of customers. And so what we're talking about doing is that that pod will work in the office one week a month minimum and then rotate. And then you can come to the office anytime you like and we'll have hotel telling space to do that. Uh, and I think that's going to be a really great balance that creates and connects that community gives people the opportunity to have face time to your point, um, but still, you know, still protects some of those key benefits. Um, and it's gonna cost us a lot less for office space as a result. So, I, I think that's a, that's um, a really compelling structure. And I, I think in part, it resonates with me, Larry, because I, I've been talking about a lot of CEOs who are grappling with the question of when should we be synchronous and when should we be asynchronous? And, you know, it's, it, it's not really clear in a lot of cases. I think one of the things we're learning though, and this comes from research by Anita Woolley and her colleagues, is that intensity of communication actually seems to matter more than frequency. So if you study, for example, remote software teams over a three month period, um, the teams that are in touch less often, but then when they are in touch, they have messages flying back and forth, are actually more creative and more productive than the teams that have maybe a daily check-in, uh, but there's less focused engagement during that time. And what happens in the, the teams that they go off for a few days and do their own work and then they come together and they're collaborating in a very focused way is they, they fall into a pattern that's called burstiness, where the, the collaboration literally seems like it's bursting with energy and ideas. And they're able to build on each other more, but they're also able to gain energy from that sense that, hey, you know what, when I'm working on a project and I'm stuck on it, I know that there are four other people on my team who are also working on this right now. And so that engages me, right? It motivates me. I think one of the things we failed to do in a lot of remote environments is to say, okay, we were good at scheduling remote meetings on Zoom. We have not been so good at saying, let's schedule remote work time where we say, all right, you know what? From one to four, I'm gonna be online and available if you need me, but otherwise I'm gonna be doing my own work. And then, you know, the big question that, that I get curious about is, okay, well, when should you do that? And in general, Larry, I hate sports metaphors applied to work. <laughs> I, I think they don't you. translate in many ways, but this is one that actually does. Uh, we've studied in, in organizational psychology, we've studied interdependence for over half a century. And the, the classic model says there are three types of interdependence. There's what's called pooled, sequential, and reciprocal. I like to think of them more though as baseball, American football, and basketball. So pooled interdependence is basically playing a baseball game. Everybody has their, their own bat. They walk up to hit their own ball. They run the bases alone. If you are working in a job or on a project that operates that way, you do not need synchronous communication very often, right? Everyone can do their individual work effectively and you can assume that the whole will be the sum of the parts. If you're playing American football though, or working on more of an assembly line structure where I work on something, I send it over to you, then Larry, you send it over to Agnes, 
She passes it over to Cassie. Cassie brings it to Isabella and then it's done. Then we probably need to coordinate, especially with each person who's doing the handoff to the next person. When we really need to schedule a shared work time and get into that pattern of burstiness is when we're working on problems that look more like playing basketball, where I work on something, I send it over to you. Then you send it back to me. I send it to you again. Then you send it to Judy. Judy sends it to Caitlin. Caitlin sends it back to me. Then I take it over to Maria. And we need everybody to have multiple eyes on multiple phases. Um, that's when we need synchro synchronous communication. And so one of the things I would love to see CEOs do in a new world of remote work is to say, you know what? The first thing you should do when you're tackling a new project or a new problem is to ask, is this more like baseball, football, or basketball? Mm -hmm. And then plan accordingly. Oh, fascinating, fascinating. We're getting lots of enthusiastic questions. So I'm gonna take a few of these. Uh, a follow-up on the family discussion. Is the idea of team better than family? <laughs> better, it depends. It depends on what you mean by team. So yeah, if, if team is your code for, I'm just gonna take a bunch of people in pooled interdependent work who don't share values or norms uh, and you know call them a team, no it's probably not gonna be much better. If on the other hand, you think about the way that Richard Hackman long defined a real team, which is to say, this is a group of people who have to collaborate interdependently in a reciprocal way to achieve a common goal and everyone has a unique role to play, then yes, a team is much better than a family. And thanks to what said, my ears keep disappearing. This annoying Zoom background is kind of truncating my appendages, so I apologize. Uh, it's better than the, the state of this room, which you cannot see. Um, so uh, that's great. Thanks, thanks, uh, Adam. Um, so someone else uh, asked, what's your definition of an, of, of an other-centered giver? So when I wrote Give and Take, I originally thought that I was studying a spectrum where takers were on one end and they were selfish. Givers were on the other end and they were generous. And most of us kind of defaulted to somewhere in the middle of that spectrum as matchers saying, look, I'll do something for you if you do something for me because I don't wanna be a taker and I also don't wanna to be too altruistic as a giver. And then something weird happened, which is I started studying the actual motivations of givers. And I had in some of my early studies, I had survey items about how much they cared about their own goals and then how motivated they were to help other people achieve their goals. And I found that there were a lot of givers who scored high on both. And what I eventually realized is yes, givers are in fact more generous than takers, right? They care much more about helping other people, but they can vary in how much they care about themselves and their own goals and well being too. And so when I, when I think about a selfless giver, I think about somebody who's high in concern for other people but low in concern for their own personal mm -hmm. ambitions. And what I found is that that increases risk for burnout. It also makes those givers more likely to be exploited by takers um, because they, they're constantly saying yes to other people's requests. They're letting other people dictate how they spend their time and they're getting taken advantage of in many situations and not able to progress with their own goals and also just getting exhausted by the, the sheer demands that get on their plate because you get a reputation for being generous and capable and pretty soon, no good deed goes unpunished. What successful givers, on the other hand, is they adopted this stance that I maybe regrettably called otherish. I was looking for an alternative to selfish. <laughs> but the, the basic idea was to say, look, they're high in concern for others, but they're also high in concern for self. And that means that they're thoughtful about who they help and when they help and how they help. So they're going to be more generous with givers or matchers than they are with takers. Right? If somebody has a history or reputation of selfish behavior, they might say, mm. no, you know what? I'm not going to reinforce that and let you get away with it. Um, they block out time to get their own work done. So they won't drop everything every time a request comes in unless it's, it's really urgent and important. And then they also try to specialize as opposed to being generalists and say, look, I'm not going to be a jack of all trades in my helpfulness. I'm going to focus on adding value where it advances the larger mission and where I have something unique to contribute. And that way, actually, you know, it, it doesn't hurt my performance. It might even help. And I'm also going to give in ways that are energizing rather than exhausting. And I think a lot of people, when I've talked about this, have confused the idea of being otherish uh, or, you know, being a, a giver who's ambitious for yourself as well as others with being a matcher. The difference is that matchers expect something back from everyone they help, right? So there's a quid pro quo, Larry, I'll help you mm -hmm. if you are willing to reciprocate. 
Whereas a giver who's, you know, who's thoughtful about being, being um, you know, I guess engaged in self-care is somebody who says, look, I will help you whenever I can with no strings attached, but I will not do it at my own expense. And I'm not gonna sacrifice myself for others. I'm gonna help others in ways that are sustainable for me. And ultimately that means I can give more. Very interesting, very interesting. I wanna change direction because um, a, a topic that uh, I think has affected people quite profoundly during the pandemic um, is the issue of loneliness. And I've been intrigued by some of the stuff you've written around it and how it's impacting people both during the pandemic, but more generally in the workplace. So what are you seeing during the pandemic and what, if, what can leaders do to help employees either fight it off or in those cases where we know someone is really struggling uh, with isolation given the limited tools we have available to us? So there, I think there's some great data on this that Ethan Bernstein and Haley Blunden published over the summer, looking at the first few months of the pandemic. And what they found was that if you look at communication between strong ties at work, so your closest colleagues, your direct reports, your immediate supervisor, that was actually up about 40%. But communication with weaker ties, your more distant colleagues, maybe some clients you don't get to interact with that often, your acquaintances professionally, people out in your supply chain, that communication was down 10%. And I think that's a problem in part because we know we get better ideas and often more useful help from weak ties than strong ties, right? One of the problems with strong ties is they know a lot of the same people and the same things that we do. So they give us redundant information. They reinforce what we already know. Weak ties have been traveling in different circles. They've been meeting different people and they can much more efficiently open up access to fresh perspectives and new ideas. And so I think we need mechanisms to open up interactions with and feedback from um, and connections with weak ties. And um, I've, I've actually co-founded one in the last couple of years. Uh, it's called Give a Toss. And the basic idea is it's a knowledge sharing platform where people can come together and make requests for something they want or need, but can't get on their own. And then they can invite people across a network to join the, the Give a Toss community. And that way everybody is both willing to seek and also give help in, in just five minutes a day. And what's interesting about this is very rarely am I able to help the same person who can help me. And so right. instead of this That's kind of matching favor trading, what you get is, you know, you, one person helps another and then that person pays it forward. And so you get this norm of generosity that spreads. You also get uh, a nice shift in the balance of who's helping in that the givers are normally the ones who are overextending themselves. And we find that they're more willing to ask in this scenario because they know that everybody's expected to make a request. And then the takers actually step up and do some of the heavy lifting because right, right. everybody's uh, contribution is visible. And so if I'm a taker and I don't offer to help anyone, everybody's gonna find out and I don't wanna get outed. So we, Wayne Baker and I actually found that on average takers tripled their contributions during this exercise relative to what they would normally give. And initially that may be reputation driven, right? But over time, what mm -hmm. happens is uh, systematically those takers end up receiving help from other people and they're not able to pay it back and they're often so driven by, by a sense of gratitude and appreciation that a weak tie, a distant colleague was willing to step up and help them, that they become motivated to pay it forward. And so you can actually start to shift a population of takers in the giving direction. Yeah. Right, yeah. Which I think is amazing. They're <laughs> so, less takers, yeah. Exactly, so um, I, think, you know, I think we need to find ways to engage with our weak ties. I would also say as a manager, I would encourage people to reconnect with their dormant ties. I love the research on dormant ties, which basically shows that dormant ties are your former strong ties. And a lot of people, when we give them this advice, they'll say, well, those ties are dormant for a reason. Actually, most of those ties are not dormant for a reason. You did not mean to fall out of touch. You got busy, you moved, you started a family, you changed jobs. Over 90% of people in, uh, in Daniel Levin and his colleagues studies on dormant ties uh, report that reconnecting, rekindling an old connection is an enjoyable experience. And you also get better help from those people than your current ties, because just like your weak ties, they have been meeting different people and learning different things. Um, but it's a lot easier to reach out to someone you used to know than someone you hardly know. So I think the pandemic is the perfect time to say, look, every week, think about somebody that you haven't spoken to in two, three, five, 10 years, get back in touch with them. And it's a great way to feel like you're not alone and also to gather meaningful information. Yeah. And I, I, I found that just various things that have happened. If nothing else, the boredom of wanting to fill some time with Zooms 
causes you to reach out to people you haven't seen or we had a we had a, a a zoom surprise toast for my daughter's you know engagement party that you know would have been 200 and turned into 10 but we got about 75 other people many who i haven't seen since my own marriage you know five years ago so it, it, you reconnect that way and it's very very powerful uh, i've got lots of questions here uh adam i'll so give we'll shorter answers the rest of the time for most of these no oh, no worries um some say 2020 has accelerated digital transformation of our companies and lives by 10 or more years Adam, what's your take on how the pandemic has changed or is changing those human relationships? And what should we expect? There was an outstanding article a couple months ago in the New York Times by Kate Murphy on this that I think is, is probably the most profound observation I've seen since March. Uh, what, what, what Kate basically said is, look, uh, if, if you feel like your social skills are getting rusty, you are not alone. If you look at studies of people who are incarcerated, and also astronauts on the International Space Station, one of the things you see is that social skills are like muscles. Um, if you don't use them, they begin to atrophy. And so I think a lot of us have been feeling awkward and that's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it can really stand in the way of relationships. It can stop us from reaching out. It can lead us to be hesitant to follow up because we felt like we didn't click with somebody or we didn't have a smooth interaction or rapport was missing. On the flip side, though, I think it has also opened up some very human vulnerability, right? And we've, you know, we've, we've all had moments of awkwardness. Uh, you know, I think everybody has been turned into BBC dad or BBC mom at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, I know just yesterday, our, <laughs> our, our, our seventh grader logged into uh, to, to class um, on, on the iPad instead of her laptop. And she didn't know that her sister had, had renamed the account uh, with uh, with a bunch of words that probably would be considered inappropriate, and the whole class no, no. laughing. Uh, and you know these these kinds of moments, I think, are are connecting us in a way that's more real than than it really would have before. And so I think that relationships, I guess, in some ways, the pandemic's been an amplifier, right? It's um, it's deepened some relationships that you know that were on a trajectory toward becoming real. Um, maybe it's pushed us further apart from people that we were already having trouble connecting with. Um, but in some ways also, I think it's, um, it's, it's really created shifts. It's led us to pull back from people that we were in touch with because of the awkwardness. And it's brought us closer together with, with people that we never would have expected mm -hmm. to find common ground with. Yeah. So I think it's, it's hard to put it in a box, but I think that's the, the most powerful dynamic that, that stands out for me. Yeah, and I think it's reduced formalities in so many interesting ways. You know, I, I think about the times like, I'll be on a call with uh, with a group of employees and somebody's dog barks or the doorbell rings. And like in the old, you know, prior to pandemic, we'd be panicked about that. And everyone, I'll watch people kind of get a little skittish about it. I'm like, please, you have got to be kidding. I don't give a, show me the dog. I want to see the dog, you know? And then one day uh, what, uh, I was on with a call and her three-year-old ran up and I'm like, no, let, let's talk to him. She's like, no, he's taking all his clothes off. He wants to change his clothes after school and he's gonna be naked in 10 seconds. Like, okay, you can turn off the video, go ahead. But I think, you know, just like making that okay in a way, uh, it'll be so interesting to see if some of that formality gets reintroduced. Um, one of the other things I wanted to ask you about given kind of your unique intersection around many things HR and the fact that, you know, the majority of the folks on our call today are uh, mid-market, you know, relatively small company HR leaders who, you know, if you have any appreciation for the distinctions between that and, you know, kind of enterprise companies, these people are jacks of all trades. Um, you know, they, they try to be masters of them all as well, which of course is a high bar to kind of deal with. And all this emotional and intellectual stuff. And uh, in a Facebook uh, group I, I track pretty closely, I just get this sense of just overwhelm because of the, the operational, the workload, and then the emotional burdens. Any advice for those folks uh, as we maybe are getting closer to the end of this to get that extra boost of, of energy to get past it? Yeah, I, I think advice is a high bar, Larry, honestly. Mm. I, I think that everybody's situation is, is probably a little bit different. And it's hard to know that, you know, that, that there's anything that might help each person. Um, I think that though, the common trend for me is, you know, as I've engaged with HR leaders in, you know, in, in smaller and mid-market companies is, it's not just jacks of all trade. It's also a bunch of de, de facto titles that don't exist in organizations and should, right? So a lot of, I know a lot of you have been turned into the chief culture officer, 
when nobody knows how to do onboarding and nobody knows how to you know, maintain a sense of, of having clear values and, and strong norms. Um, there's also been an open question around, you know, what, what does it mean to have a chief collaboration officer, right? Who's, who's making sure that the people who do need to be communicating and getting into patterns of burstiness are meeting each other and interacting with each other and sharing ideas and busting silos, right? I think that work has all fallen on HR. There's also, I mean, we are in the middle of a massive mental health crisis. Right, and I, I, I don't want to throw employee engagement under the bus too much because I think it was a helpful turn uh, for organizations to say, look, we, we actually need to put employees at the center of our picture and we need to think about you know, how, how much attention, how much absorption, how much energy people bring to work. I think one of the things we're learning during the pandemic is engagement is not enough, right? We need to focus on employee well-being. We need to be concerned about, look, are people so engaged that they're burning themselves out? And I think that, that HR leaders and managers are probably one of the most vulnerable groups because of the burden of having to carry everybody else's burdens. Mm. I think, you know, I don't know what to do about that. I think the place I would start though is, I, um, I worked on a study years ago with, uh, with Dave Hoffman and Jakar Lee, which was in hospitals. And we were interested in, in studying patterns of help seeking, knowing that one of the best predictors of people receiving help probably the best predictor actually is them being willing to ask for it. And I know that in HR, it's especially difficult to do that because you're the one who's supposed to be the giver, right? Or the caregiver. Uh, and it's, so it's, it feels like role reversal. And yet empirically 75 to 90% of all helping in organizations begins with a request. And so if you want your givers to come out of the woodwork or if you wanna implement structural changes or cultural changes that will make a difference, um, then the request has to be made. So one of the interesting things that this hospital did that we were studying was they created a nurse preceptor role, which is basically a nurse on each unit who does not have patient care responsibilities. And we found that help seeking was significantly heightened in the units where the nurse preceptor existed because nurses would say, okay, I'm not gonna be bothering that person. I'm not a burden to them. It's their job to help me. And that person was also really qualified to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if there's an HR equivalent here. Um, even in an HR team, right, to say if we can rotate each week who's in that kind of caring for the caregiver role and who's taking care of all the other HR people. Uh, and if we spread that role around a little bit, will we all be in a better position both to get the help we need and also to give it? I don't know. Maybe. What do you what do you make of that? Mm -hmm. Interesting. As you were saying that, the first thing that occurred to me, and I've thought about this more than once, is that the CEO needs to be very attentive to the needs of HR at a time like this. Um, but I, you know, and some of those, you know, I work with a lot of customers where there's one person. So there's, there, you could find someone, but they probably wouldn't have the domain expertise to be that supportive. I will say this though, I, I, I love what you said about this notion of engagement at this time, because what I write a lot about and repeat a lot about and, and we incorporate it into our values and it's not an easy thing to do, which is to get in touch with your own sense of empathy. Um, and if I have found that if I, if I start or I coach um, around empathy and help people understand that just people feeling like you care enough to hear it out and do what they can with the tools that they have can be enormously impactful. Um, and you don't have to, you don't have to move the mountain uh, in order to make a difference. And uh, that, you know, I think that's not easy for everyone either. No, it's not. And there's a, again, pre-pandemic study that I think speaks to that in a, in a memorable way. This is Ginka Togel and colleagues. Uh, the, the basic study was of what do employees expect of their managers? And then what do managers think their responsibilities are? And when managers were asked, they said, look, it's above and beyond for me to know what's going on in my employees' lives outside work, to read their emotions, you know, to, to care about kind of the, the quality of their lives overall. And if you go to those managers' employees, they said, nope, that is part of my manager's job. I expect them to ask about my life. I, you know, I believe that it's their responsibility to, to make sure that I'm doing okay emotionally and in terms of mental health. And so I think the, the pandemic has both raised the bar on those expectations and I hope it's also helped a lot of managers realize, you know what, that is part of my job. Yeah, no, very valid point. Here, Grace had an interesting follow-up question to the talk about remote work. Uh, said, Adam mentioned a great perk, perk for the remote work is that we're able to hire from all over the country and not just a small pool. However, you also mentioned it's hard to build culture or, or create advancement opportunities if it's 100% remote and folks want to come into the office occasionally. What's the way, what, what do you suggest then, when, how, how you evolve culture when you have a mixture? 
especially uh, those people that are always going to be 100 percent remote yeah larry i mean this is something we've we've talked about it namely uh which i think is yeah. is probably applicable to everybody who's joined us today which is there's something we can learn from running exit interviews um, I think exit interviews have made sense as long as organizations have existed, right? Because if somebody's going to leave, there's a lot you can learn about how you could have kept them and how to design a job and a managerial relationship and a culture uh, to be more motivating or more supportive. It is also the dumbest time to ask those set of questions, right? Why, why would you pose them when somebody's already announced their departure? Right. Right. So that only if you had a time machine, you could go back and fix it. What I've worked with organizations to do for years is to flip exit interviews upside down and run entry interviews. Mm -hmm. And think about the same kinds of questions you would normally ask at exit. And in somebody's first week or first month on the job to ask them, why did you join? What are your expectations of a manager and of an organization? Tell me about your favorite project you've ever worked on so I can understand the kind of work that, that you're really passionate about. Um, you know, are there skills you want to learn? Do you have development objectives in the next few years? Um, tell me about the most horrible boss you've ever had. So I can try not to be that person, right? That, that conversation happening early on, I think has a couple of effects. One is that it makes people feel valued from day one. And two, it helps their managers learn how to customize their job and that relationship to better meet their, their needs and goals. And I think we should be doing that during onboarding, right? I think every manager should be running entry interviews. And I think we could probably also be running re-entry interviews to say, you know what, since mm -hmm. March, we have all run personal experiments yeah. with you know, different ways idea. of working, different ways of collaborating, different schedules. And why not share all that so that we take onboarding as an opportunity to say, you know what, you, you haven't worked with us before. We would love to find out what your practices are, mm -hmm. right? What, what you've done in your prior organizations, what you've tested out during the pandemic. And maybe we can evolve our culture based on that. Interesting. I'm going to take one last follow-up question that's related to this. Um, does virtual work require uh, more or less formal leadership? Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I think it requires both. I think it requires yes. different formal leadership. Uh, I think leaders have to work a lot harder to, to get consistency of, of communication when it comes to vision and values. Right? You can't just walk into the organization and observe and trust that leaders role modeling certain behaviors is going to cascade through the organization. So I think that has to be much more intentional. I think on the other hand, though, we're, we're heavily reliant now on informal leadership every time we open a Zoom window, right? every time we end up communicating on the digital platform to say, okay, somebody is setting those norms. Um, somebody is going to decide, okay, what does it mean to live our values? Are we going to agree that cameras are on all the time? And we're going to see that as a sign of focus and engagement. Or are we going to say, you know what? Everybody's going through Zoom exhaustion. We have some introverts who are especially vulnerable to that. And we're going to, going to designate certain times for cameras off. Are we going to build the kind of culture where you can have a, a virtual meeting while you're washing your dishes? Knowing that, I, I don't know about you, Larry, I do some of my best thinking while I'm dishwashing. Yeah. And yeah. I don't feel like I need my camera on that time, but I'll tell you what, I am looking for anything to think about that's not the scrubbing work. And so it's one of the best times for me to, to have my creative conversations. Um, anyway, I think those kinds of conversations um, and norm setting moments really require informal leadership. Yeah, and, and a lot of thought. Like I, I find that the range of opinions around that stuff a, we don't, we haven't contemplated it in any serious way. B, we were, we flew into this thing, so we had no idea what we're doing. So now, only now, are we stepping back and both seeing that there's a range of belief systems around it, a range of preferences, and we actually have to rethink it in a more fundamental way because it's going to be around for the long term. And of course, we all have our dirty little secret about what we've done with the video camera off. Uh, usually, you know, restricted to laundry, cooking, and other various, you know. Uh, appropriate pursuits. Um, but but I, I agree that, you know, we, we don't get too worked up uh, about whether the camera's on or off uh, as long as we have engagement. Well, listen, uh, Adam, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, by far uh, uh, beneficial, I, I guarantee for the over 250 people that joined us today. I apologize in advance. We had a whole bunch of questions that we just didn't have time to tackle. Um, but I think that uh, by any measure, uh, no one's gonna walk away from this session without some great insight and maybe a little boost of energy. So Adam, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. 
No, thank you. Really thrilled that, that we got to do this. And you know, one of the things I love about working with Namely is you're not only providing software to help people solve HR problems, you're actually encouraging people to rethink how they work and how we can make work more human. And I think that is sorely needed in the world. And I just want to say two things in closing. One is you use the term rethinking a bunch of times. Uh, I have I have not yes. yet shown this live, but before the <laughs> pandemic started, I, uh, I was working on this book about how to get people to think again. And I think HR is at the heart of this, right? To say, look, a lot of CEOs are trying to rethink what it means to build a culture and promote collaboration. And we are probably the group that is the best poised to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. The second thing I wanna say is, um, I really see HR as the heart and soul of workplaces. And so for everyone here today, the work you do is so important. If I had to have a real job, I would want yours. Thank you all for doing it. <laughs> there you go. I agree with you for sure as a software company executive as well. All right, Adam, thank you so much. And to all of you that have joined us today, uh, we thank you so much for your time. Uh, we hope you have a wonderful holiday and stay safe and healthy. Thank you.